comes from Philippians chapter 2. These wonderful verses hear now God's word. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptying himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. And from his fullness have we all received grace upon grace. Hallelujah. Amen. Let us pray. God, in different ways, we've already prayed, and this is uh, knitting a bunch of prayers together, those that we sing and those that we say in silence and those that the pastor says. And right now, we want to unite and make the point of this prayer that the message read and preached would be something that would bless our hearts, help us to love you and follow you to that end. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we are just coming out of Christmas tide. The 12 days of Christmas ended on Epiphany, January 6th. And yet there's still a, a bit of momentum from those holidays still here. And when we are talking about the Christmas holidays, of course, we're talking about the Christmas story. We talk about it before the 25th, on the 25th, after the 25th. And as we do so, we reference uh, Mary and the angel appearing to her. We uh, reference Joseph and the dream. We reference uh, Zechariah and his being without speech and Elizabeth and the visit from Mary and how the babies leapt for joy in their wombs. And we reference Anna and Simeon and we go on and on right to the three kings and, and all of that. Now, some people don't. Some people for Christmas, it's about eggnog and decorating and shopping. But behind it, of course, is the Christmas story. And we reference it, and when we reference it, we reference it that way. What I want to do today is not just retell those parts of the story, as we have been doing for nearly a month now, but I want to look at the implications of that story that we can use to benefit our lives in the days of this 2022 ahead. Now, the, the spinal cord of the story, of course, is that God came into human existence, right? That, that, that's the bottom line. Now, God has entered into human existence prior I mean, he entered into human existence, for example, as the flame of the burning bush where it was flaming but not consumed. Uh, that was him. Uh, he's appeared as the angel of the Lord. He's appeared as the, the glory cloud, the, the pillar of light by night and the, the glory cloud of shade by day. That was him. And he's appeared as the the... Uh, reasoning and the goodness behind the Mosaic law. Uh, that was him. And uh, it, it was him entering in human existence through the, the voice of the prophets. But here in this Christmas story, we celebrate God coming into human existence in a totally different way. In fact, what we look at is God in his totality entering into the complete way of a human being. That's why we say, sing, veiled in flesh the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity, pleased as man with men to dwell, hail our Emmanuel, meaning God with us. And he, God himself is so with us that he became as us. 
Now, every week, just as I did, I say, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's the Christmas story from the evangelist John. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's the, the backbone, the spinal cord of what we're talking about in this magnificent event. And, you know, we could say that uh, God showed up as a prophet and rented a house next door. That'd be good. Or, and better yet, that he bought a house next door. That's, that's really putting some skin in the game. Uh, it, or we could say that he came as an angel and stayed in our guest room. That'd be pretty good. But what we're talking about is that God is not sending an emissary as a prophet or an angel, but God himself, totally God, has come into human form and doesn't stay in the guest room. He's a part of our family room, our kitchen. He's a part of our very lives. With us, as us, really with us, and really as us. I know two guys, they've been friends for a long, 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 long time. And, and one's an average guy, blue collar guy, uh, tries to pay his bills many months, it's a little bit more month than money. And uh, the other guy, his friend, is fabulously wealthy. I mean, uh, uh, a car every year, several cars in the garage, all the man toys, boats and motorcycles and things like that. And yeah, he's had lavish vacations, he has a couple of homes, they're the same age and they've been friends for a long time. But here's the thing, the average guy has actually sweated uh, having to pay for bills. The other guy never has. And, and so no matter how you cut it, there is an understanding and experience gap between the two. A lot of friendship, but there's an experience gap between the two. In the Christmas story, what we find is that God has taken away the gap. He's just taken away the gap. And I wanna ask, what, what is the implication for that? Well, I th there are many, but I'm gonna go through three, and I, I need to do pretty quickly because of everything we have to do today, but will I do it quickly? That's the question, right? Um, I'll try. Uh, one of the implications has to do with suffering. I mean, if you're drawing breath and have any cognition whatsoever, you look around and you go, there's atrocity, there's murder, there's, there is suffering, you know, and, and, and it's a big question mark. It's a big, hairy question mark. Uh, one Sunday, I, I went to the gathering room where we were drinking coffee and there were some visitors, I approached them, and uh, they were relatives. And I had such a great conversation with them. Not real long, but a great conversation. And uh, the conversation was, they weren't much into church. They were just here to appease a relative. Yeah, okay. I love the frankness, don't you know? And, uh, and, and then they, they went on to tell me why they weren't much into church. Why they weren't much into church is because of suffering. They saw suffering. I mean, how can you worship a God who you say is good and powerful, and yet there's suffering? I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a mighty big question. It's a conundrum. Well, I, I gave them the answer. I, there is an answer. I mean, you, you file it away, use it. You can dance around hoping for another answer, but there is a good answer. You want to hear it? Yeah. Okay, so God could make us puppets and there'd be no suffering. Or he could make us free so that there's love. Pay your money, take your choice. He decided to put all his marbles on giving us freedom that we might love. It's either one or the other. Uh, don't ask for no suffering and then complain about having no free will. 90% of the suffering comes from bent human beings and the way they use their free will. And the other bit, you could say, well, it has to do with natural disaster and even a 
And, and we, we're not going to take all the play out of this, but even a part of that is you don't have to live in a fault zone or, 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 or a flood zone, and you don't have to emit carbon that affects the climate and things like that. So even the natural things, there, there's some kind of culpability of the free, broken human being, you and me. Well, I can't say that they were terribly impressed with that, <laughs> you know. Uh, a lot of this isn't a logical thing. It's a gut thing, right? And uh, anyway, we, we parted company, and that was that. But, you know, has this ever happened to you? The second you step away, you think, I should have said this. I <laughs> like, why can't I just be on top of it all the time? And uh, it, it remind, we're ordaining Elder's Day, and it reminded me of... Uh, when I was ordained as a minister of the Word and Sacrament in Kerrville, Texas, there are lots of things to do, but one of the things is you got to stand in front of all these ministers and session members and take questions. And anyway, I got a question, I gave a good answer, and then I sat down and I went, I should have said, <laughs> I should have said. Anyway, it, it was all passable, of course, but I went, I should have said. And you know what I should have said? I should have said, God feels, God feels what you feel. I mean, God feels what it's like to be a wet baby. God feels what it's like to uh, be an immigrant on the run. God feels what it's like to do culture shock. God feels what it's like to lose a father and have brothers and sisters and learn a trade and God feels what it's like to have poverty, nowhere to lay his head. God feels what it's like to have a loved one be sick and have a friend die. Uh, God knows what it's like to be oppressed and imprisoned falsely <laughs> because of jealousy and ingratitude. Uh, God feels all of that because he's been there. And, and, and he feels not only death, but he feels murder, <laughs> you know? He, he, he feels again. In Hebrews, we're told that he, he is tempted in all ways like us. And so he, he even knows the temptation side of things. So he feels. He actually, we're told, he, he came for the express purpose of giving his life as a ransom for many. That it, he, he came to suffer. He came to get in it with us. Whew. And you know, it, it just strikes me that it's, if he came into existence, largely in part to suffer with us and for us, you know, that, that hand of suffering it's hard to be under a hand of suffering and it to be your own hand of causing suffering. Yeah, I, I maybe that's too much to spend, but I just have a hard time picturing it. There's an angle or two I could see that. But it, if he's under the hand of suffering, it's hard to say that that hand of suffering is his own hand. Well, whether that makes sense or not, and, and we're never going to completely satisfy ourselves on this problem of suffering, there is one thing, though, because of the Christmas story, because God entered human existence because he cares and feels that we cannot say. We cannot say that he doesn't care. He, ne he, he didn't exempt himself. He could have stayed as a potentate detached in heaven, but he came and walked in our shoes, felt what we felt. So however you want to do it, the one thing, as you're standing there with the perplexity of suffering, you cannot say, God doesn't care. In Jesus Christ, he cared, and cares even now. The second thing I'm thinking that is an implication for us of this Christmas story of the word becoming flesh is that we're told not only that he cares, but we're enjoined to care ourselves and told how to care. Uh, that was the scripture. Have this mind in you, which was in Christ Jesus. So as he cares for us, we are to engage 
and be willing to weep with those who weep and laugh with those who laugh. We're, we're to get beside them. We're to be with them as them. 1910, Teddy Roosevelt in Paris wrote this and then spoke it in a speech. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory or defeat. Jesus didn't stay in the bleachers of the arena. He got into the arena. And we, his followers, are to have that mind. Get out of the bleachers. Get out of the pews. Get into the arena. That's the second implication. Is he engaged for us, then we engage for others. And here's the third implication. The, the third implication has to do with peace with God and eternal life. See, when we're talking about the word became flesh, we're talking about divinity becoming humanity. We're, we're talking about the infinite becoming definite, the infinite becoming finite. We're talking about the eternal becoming temporal, the immortal becoming mortal, the everlasting becoming killable. See, as the immortal, he cannot die. And all the Old Testament sacrificial system is that the wages of sin is death. It isn't metaphorically death, symbolically a death, a quasi-death, a pseudo-death. It's a death. And as an immortal, he couldn't die for you and me. But as a mortal, he can. But he has to be as infinite as God to cover all of our sin as pure as God to cover all of our sin, but he has to be fully human so that he can die for our sin. So as we go into 2022, know that God, in whatever suffering you see or experience, what you cannot say is that he doesn't care because remember Christmas, it tells us he, he does. And secondly, that we're to care we're to get into the arena. And third, that becoming that baby, he went to the cradle, understanding it was all about going to the cross, to die that you and I may have the wages of sin, death paid for by his death. And that gives us entry, not just to 2022, but into the kingdom of heaven. Thanks be to God, we pray. Lord, we thank you for your